Welcome to Lakeshore Focus, a weekly show highlighting the key issues, important events, and interesting people in our region. I'm Keith Kirkpatrick. Our guest this week embodies the essence of this show because she knows the key issues, she has witnessed the important events, and she is definitely an interesting person in our region. Let's welcome one of my regulars with our annual review of stories in the news, Krista Zivanovic, who is the deputy editor for news with the Times Media Company. Chris, it's great to have you on the show again. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. You, you and Jerry might be setting my record for the people I have on the most. Really? I think so, because we how many shows have we done with the year in review? We've done three or four. Something like I that. I can't remember. I think yeah. almost every year that I've done this. Yes. So, yeah. so the idea was um, I interviewed Jerry a couple weeks ago and just kind of his career in journalism, and I thought, you know, I should do Krista also the same way and just kind of get it. And when we do the year in review, we've had both of you on the show and people get to know a little bit more about you rather than just your opinions about the best stories. Yes. Well, and it's kind of weird because I'm usually the one asking the questions and possibly inadvertently putting people on the spot. So I guess this turnabout is fair play. So now I'm on the spot and I have to talk. So, so how does it feel being in the interviewee seat? It's weird, and I guess I, I have a new respect and understanding for those who are answering questions and trying to think on their feet. So, so maybe <laughs> I'll ask you one of those questions today. You go, gosh, you really, well, that's, that's great. What question do you think makes people the most uneasy when you ask them? Is there a certain question that tends to just make people squirm? I don't know if there's a question per se, but I think just the fact that most news journalists um, are very direct and they get to the point, they don't really, they try to maybe put a person at ease, but a lot of times they don't have time to. So in being so direct, I think that we sort of maybe get used to putting people on the spot and not thinking anything of it because we're just trying to get the answers and put the story together. And maybe we should be a little more sensitive to maybe the ickiness factor of being direct. <laughs> Is that a technical term, the ickiness yeah. factor? <laughs> so, so do you feel like that you would, that by being so direct, you maybe lose some of the content in interviewing people that they are more standoffish? Well, I think it depends on how quickly we have to get a story. I think most reporters try to be sensitive to that and try to give, you know, people enough time to think about what they're going to say. Um, but I think instead of losing something, I think maybe you gain an advantage because you've got to get the story and you have to have someone answer. And a lot of times people will say, this is really sensitive. Can I get back to you? And of course, we say of course, because we're really not after putting someone on the spot per se. <clears throat> we're after what really transpired, what they really think, what maybe they really are going to do, what they think should happen. You know, I'm asking you all these questions about applying your trade, and we probably should say for the audience, the viewers, how long have you been basically in journalism, been writing stories? Let's just say many decades. <laughs> you're, yeah. you're, not, you're, you're not gonna really tell us, right? <laughs> no, um, but I will say yesterday was my 19 year anniversary with the Times. I started on Veterans Day in 1996 and I started as the business editor. And they were trying to go in a fresh direction and develop the business department as a legitimate, before it sort of been catch as catch can, it was more featurey, news featurey. So I came on board to sort of improve the stature, and we we did that. Uh, they gave me three reporters, which was a lot for that size paper, and we covered both Lake and Porter. Just a few years earlier, the Times had bought the Vidette Messenger. That's so, been twenty years. Yeah, so now. more than wow. that, a little bit more, I think. So they really wanted to make Porter County feel a part of the region. They wanted to make it more regional. So that was my task. You know, the Times has always tried to be hyper-local in its coverage because we're the only place, you know, between Chicago and Indianapolis, we feel like that's our franchise. Why, why, why did you start 
on Veterans Day. Was there any specific no, reason? No, it just, just, was, just happened to be? It just happened to be the day that I was okay. supposed to come in when they had everything ready for me to come Why'd in. Why'd they bring you in specifically? Because you had been in journalism before that, right? But why you I had business? Been a, I had been a business reporter at the Detroit News for several years, and before that at the Capitol Times in Madison, Wisconsin, my first journalism job several decades ago. <laughs> so I had covered business on and off, and I also had been an editor. I'd been assistant features editor. I had had different editing posts. So I think they felt like I had both the experience of having been a reporter, so I understand how hard it is to be a reporter, but also had editing experience. I had managed people. I had run a small desk. So I think that that had all of the elements that maybe they were looking for. And um, no one else on staff really wanted the job. Of course, when I took the job, then everyone had ideas about how I should how you run should be it. doing it, right? Right, from the publisher on down, we would joke about it, but nobody really wanted the responsibility. But I, I do want to make a plug for the Times and for the kinds of journalists that we've had there for decades. You guys are great writers. We, um, when I got there, my mandate was just, you know, elevate. So I changed, I assigned everyone multiple beats. We elevated the structure so that we could break daily news. We started doing bigger projects, more in-depth things, more enterprise investigative. And to Two years later, um, I had us join the Society of Edit uh, Business Editors and Writers, Cebu, and it's a very prestigious journalism business group. And we won two first places in the nation for our size newspaper. I got to go to Washington, D.C. and pick up both awards for Spot News and Best Overall Business Section. So some people might look at the paper and say, business news, that doesn't seem very exciting. I mean, it is to me, I like business, so, <clears throat> but do you ever get that criticism if people go, business stuff's kind of boring? Actually, no, because our business writers are among the most prolific. Half the business stuff appears on A1. Today, for instance, our A1 line story was the Ford Hegwish plant investing $900 million. Well, those are jobs. Half the people who work there live in Northwest Indiana. I don't know if that's exact, but, so, you know, great stuff comes out of business all the time. One of the running themes for us in business news has been the implosion and survival of the steel industry. For every steel job, there are five jobs in the community that rely on it. In healthcare, and in, in the grocery store, in many disparate areas, you might not even think of that those good paying manufacturing jobs keep the economy going. Those people buy cars, they buy homes, they repair their homes, they put new roofs on. So when I got there in 96, we had just witnessed a 10-year implosion where we had, I don't know how many oh, thousands, thousands, you know, 50,000, 30,000, right. I can't remember quite how many to, you know, coming down to 30,000. I think now we're down to less than 20, it might be 10,000. Yeah, I think it's around that number. Yeah. Well, let me ask you, in all the years that you've been doing this, is, is there one, I kind of asked Jerry the same thing, is there one story that you're like, just really kind of look back and are very proud of or just felt really good about the fact that you wrote that story or did that story? Well, it wouldn't be for me writing. I wrote a column for five years, but I don't really write as much as edit. But I was very proud of, we did something called the World of Steel. And we went to Japan, we went to Europe, and we had someone from South America Tough do a series huh? of stories for us. <laughs> well, it was in the sense that um, we were in the middle of this. I had been on the business, it, this was maybe 99, 2000, and we were trying to assess where we were globally and competition-wise. And it came about because our assistant business editor um, was, uh, he had gotten a two-week uh, fellowship to go to Japan, and he had decided to study steel. And so we thought, well, we've, let's send our steel writer to Europe. He went to France and to England, and then I hired through the Associated Press a reporter in South America, and we did a three week, it was three Sundays in a row, and it was a huge, it took did us Did you get to go? Months, no, of course not. Well, I so never get, get any of the glory. Edit. Yes, I got to direct it though and work very closely with some really smart people. So why were um, you so proud of this? Well, because, we, it, you know, I wish it had won more awards than it did. It won some national awards and some state awards. And um, it was really very sophisticated, high-end work. But the reporters were, were so good, they were such good writers that they made it really accessible to the point where the, the steel writer, uh, Clint Mitchell, who went to France and England, even included fun sidebars about 
cultural differences. You know, he said, can you imagine at U.S. Steel or Inland Steel, as it was then, guys going into the lunchroom and putting a dollar in and getting a small bottle of red wine to go with their lunch. But in France... Well, it'd, be, it'd be beer here, <laughs> right? And, yeah, but even beer, can you imagine? Right. But they thought nothing of... I mean, their laws were different, their culture's different. They go and have a bottle of wine with their lunch and then go back to work. So they they really just included a lot, and it was really a wonderful Did you put that at, in the... You guys oh, put that yes. In the story? Well, oh, then, yes. We had all sorts of Then you probably had a whole story. bunch of steel workers who were going to apply for jobs in France. <laughs> so, you know, that, that sounds yeah. like a great, a great spot to go. So let me go the opposite side of sure. this, which is how about a story where you felt like, oh, my gosh, we just, like, missed the boat. We just hmm. messed this up. Just, you know, things fell apart. I mean, anything that you're just like, oh, I, I hate to even think about that story. I'm sure there have been many, <laughs> but I think I've locked them out. I can't think of anything. I guess the, the closest example would th w to that would be if we missed a story and it appeared in the competition the next day. And, you know, no matter how mad the boss would be, we ourselves would be so much madder at ourselves. Has that because, ever happened? Oh, many times. Oh, really? Many okay. Years. Oh, I yeah. just, how, how does that happen the, that somebody misses it on any side of, of the well, press? Well, you know, reporters are human beings and they have personalities. So a lot of the news we get has to do with uh, reporters cultivating sources. And some reporter might have a better rapport with a source who would just tell that reporter. And it didn't happen often, but once in a while it did happen. Or a source would be miffed at a reporter in, in our shop, and so would purposely go to the other shop and say, I'm going to screw them over, I'm going to give you this. And so it really wouldn't be anybody's fault, per se. It's just somebody in a snit. So all of us have seen those, the movies, you know, where the, you have the secret sources and all that, and then the lawsuits and whatever. So did you ever have a, a secret source? You know, where you're like, this person's feed me information, but I... Absolutely. I don't know if anyone recalls... I'm not going to ask recalls. you who it is or anything. No. <laughs> well, um, when we exposed the GUEA, the Gary Urban Enterprise uh, Agency, the um, director at the time, who I think just passed away a few months ago, the director at the time was using the money to uh, improve her home, that of her family members. They were buying new the cars, story. and she had a Denali parked in her driveway. Um, they were funneling money to their church. Um, some of it was for an elimosinary and good cause, but it was not meant to, what it was meant to do was try and develop business in that urban enterprise zone and help get jobs for people. And this person was taking thousands upon thousands of dollars. Eventually it led to the feds came in, they were charged, they, they were tried, they, they pled deals. So, and our reporter at the time who since went to Minnesota and is now practicing law, um, she had, the source came to me first. And you have to take these sources with a grain of salt sometimes, because sometimes they have an ax to grind, it isn't really that big a deal. You gotta be really careful. But there was something about this source that just struck me as not an ax to grind as much as someone who really loved Gary, loved the city, and was really upset at seeing this federal money go to this person. So this source supplied photos of the Denali in the driveway. I mean, this source really did a lot of legwork on this source's own first. Which would give you a lot of information then to work So with. I gave it to, at the time, Megan Lindsay, who was our Lake County government reporter, and I said, Megan, let's check this out. And boy, it was like peeling an onion. The more she found out, the more terrible stuff we uncovered. And wow. this story had legs for several years afterward as GUEA tried to write itself and, and do some better things. But that one, that was a good secret source. Huh. So in your office space back at work, I mean, av after these decades of doing this, is there something that sits in your office or hangs in your office that's really of uh, special meaning to you from your career? I think that, you know, awards mean a lot to us because, let's face it, we're not in this for the money or the, okay. the recognition. But we do win a lot of awards, our newsroom. And I take personal pride in that because I work on a lot of those stories with the reporters. And um, the, one of the ones I'm most proud of is when I worked in Portage, in Porter County, we, uh, it was just the beginning of the tip of the iceberg with looking at heroin. And this was in 07, 06, and the stats were that 
Porter County had the high, uh, was in one of the top 10 in the nation per capita of heroin use, even then. And we have a lot of heroin in Lake and Porter counties today. But we did like a 12-story series, and we looked at all the suppliers, we looked at we, 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 look, we interviewed families, we interviewed young people, and on the cover of, for the first day of the series, we ran a photo. We killed ourselves to get a photo of every single person who had died of an overdose over a certain amount of time. And we won the state's highest award for journalism, the Kent Cooper Award, for that. And I was proud of that for my staff, because they really threw themselves into that. And they were still doing their own work, and yet, you know, walking and chewing gum at the same time working on this as well. Huh. How come you've never got into television or radio yourself? Because you know you you're you're good at speaking and presenting oh, and talking. You. So and you like to talk. So how come you've not? How do you devote yourself to the writing and editing when you're good at verbally presenting? I, that's a good question. You know, I think when I started out, I sort of don't take this the wrong way. A lot of print journalists at the time looked down on the TV journalists. Mm. We, If you're a pure journalist and a purist, you do print and you write and you investigate. That's why you guys look at me funny when I walk in over and there. I know. <laughs> now I wish I had. And I remember my late mother constantly haranguing me when I was younger and could have made the move. I think at my age now, I don't know how that would work out. But when I was younger, my mother constantly haranguing me, you should go on TV and you should do this and you don't self-promote enough and blah, blah, blah. And maybe, you know, for, for your viewers, listen to your mother. I probably should have done that and would have had a very different career in life. A different career. Well, you know, it's interesting. It's, it's interesting because, you know, I had no journalism background coming into this at all. Uh, so now and the view. You and, and are several, very good at this. Jerry and I have talked about this. We love talking well, with you because you're a great interviewer. Well, thank you for that. And But uh, I probably have viewers sitting out there go, that explains a lot now. He's never had a journalism <laughs> background, so on, maybe on the good and the bad of it. Well, so. I think most journalists are smart. And if you're smart, you can figure it out. That's really true. Yeah. So, so during your career, what was a, a tough lesson to learn? If you, you're smart. What did you have to figure out that just, wow, took you a while to kind of figure it out or it just kind of hit you finally? Diplomacy, which I still have a hard time with. You're pretty I don't, candid, right? I don't mean to be brusque. I really don't. And and I do, I am sensitive to people's feelings. And I, I you know, I think a lot of journalists are. But so, I live in my head a lot. You know, I always like to say people are like, what is your hobby? I don't have a hobby. My hobby is thinking. I read. I read fiction, nonfiction, politics, history, fashion. So when your hobby is thinking, you spend a lot of time in your head. And I think sometimes I'm so in my head that I forget my surroundings. And so I really had to learn to be diplomatic, both with sources, with my staff, with bosses, with so with I my have, mother constantly mother, haranguing sure. me to switch careers. <laughs> so how about, I, and I asked Jerry this question about a story <clears throat> in his career that just really kind of touched him. Didn't win an award for necessarily or anything, but just, is there some story that you just felt like it just touched you? I mean, just all had an impact ones, on you personally? All of the ones with children. And I think it's because when I started at the Times, I was newly divorced and my children were very young. They were five and three. And the one that killed me, not because it was the worst, but it just, the choked, the little boy who had been buried and was finally found, and his father and stepmother had, it turns out, had tortured him and put him in a cage. I'm guessing that he had probably a learning disability. Maybe he was autistic. I, I think that, that he had some problems. It sounded like, and they just didn't know how to cope with it or how to deal with that it. That was one of the Black Oak area. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and they just tortured this child. And, the, and all the siblings, there were so many problems with the siblings and the relatives. And, and every time, but it's not just the Choate story, but that one just really killed us because of the description of how he was kept in the cage. Yeah, and, and the information and kept unfolding, diaper, right? Yeah, oh, it just, every day you just didn't want to come in to deal with that. And in general, stories about children being tortured, you know, one little boy whose father tied a, this thing so hard around his wrists that he had swollen arms and, and uh, marks all over bodies and chests and parents lying and saying he fell off the bed. Those, I think, 
there are, I don't even know how my reporters, the court reporters, write those because I can barely edit them. And wow. there have been times when I just couldn't finish editing and made someone else do it. And I'm not a, a wimpy person. I know, those got to be very disturbing. Yeah. We're down to a couple minutes, but uh, in this last couple minutes, if, if there was someone wanted to go into journalism today, I mean, what kind of advice would you give somebody if they were said, I really want a, a career in journalism? Make sure you know how to multitask, learn a lot of things. You're going to have to be a videographer and a photographer. You're going to have to be able to tweet, take photographs, interview, listen, uh, pick on the key points, think on your feet. It's, got, it's going to be very fast. But um, so, you know, develop all of those aspects, but also don't forget the real reason you're doing it. It's to tell stories. It's to be a proud member of the fourth estate. You are a fourth member of, you know, being a watchdog for wrongdoing, for telling good stories, for inspiring people, for informing them. So keep, keep mind of that and also keep mind of your objectivity. I know with all of this, you know, CNN and Fox News and everybody thinks that's real journalism. It isn't. Real journalism is always trying to be objective. Despite whatever your personal views are or your feelings, always try and get both sides or as many sides as you can and let the reader decide, let the viewer decide. I'm glad to hear that that's still alive and well in journalism because that's what I was taught or understood coming up and yeah. it seems like we have lost some of that today. But that would be a whole nother subject for another yeah. show, right? About where we are with that kind of ethics or lack thereof yes. today. Well, I'm looking forward to the show we're going to do probably in a few weeks It'll on end-of-the-year yeah. stories with Jerry. That's always a, a fun thing to do. Uh, you love that so much. I do, well, I love Jerry. He and I used to work together, so we're we're you know good good acquaintances and former colleagues. So. He he said the same thing about yeah. you. Yeah. So it's a mutual admiration yeah. society. Is that what it is? You guys are chair of each other's fan clubs. Yes, we right? are. There yes, you go. We are. Well, thanks for being on the show. I really uh, Thank appreciate you. it and. Uh, you'll be thinking about those stories we're going to have, I guess, coming up, Already right? Already begun. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks, Krista. Thanks. When we were kids, Mom and Dad would say, before crossing the street, stop and look both ways. As we got older and were eligible to be put behind the wheel and drive, we were given a second command. When you come to a railroad track, Stop, look, and listen. In Northwest Indiana, that is a pretty important edict considering there are railroad crossings everywhere. Listen was added to the stop and look both ways mantra to give us one more step toward safety. These helpful tips, often repeated and sometimes delivered with great inflection, were life lessons in disguise. Think about it. If we would all practice stop, look, and listen, the world might be a better place. Before we react in words or deeds, how about listening to that inner voice, which often sounds like mom or dad, and follow their command. Stop. Don't do anything. Just stop and think. Rather than jumping in, opening your mouth, or taking one more step. Next, look. Take a moment to observe the situation. Consider what is happening and analyze what is in front of you, on your left, on your right, and behind you. Finally, while you are still frozen with your senses engaged at full throttle, listen. Yes, I know hearing is one of the senses, but let's practice high-level listening. Basic listening is just hearing and being able to reflect back what you've heard. In-depth listening requires us to understand why something is being said or done. And what is the emotional content driving it? Real listening takes effort and energy. You have to deeply concentrate on it to truly comprehend. Wow, the world really could be a better place if we would stop, look, and listen. Instead of heated remarks being exchanged in a meeting, we might have people trying to grasp what others are saying. Rather than a shove, a fist, or a finger, we could have parties who back up, and consider why the other person is so upset. In the place of caustic cutting words, someone might bite their tongue and think about the circumstances that led to the feelings of anger and frustration. People listening and trying to understand each other? What a novel idea. Hey, what did you think of my comments or this show? 
Stop, look, listen. Are you practicing the concept just shared with you? I'm sure you are unless your mouth is already open or your hand is on the phone or tablet. I do want to hear from you with your words of wisdom and profound thoughts. You can reach us at focus at lakeshorepublicmedia.org or through our website, both listed on your screen. Watch for our show on the big stories of 2015 with Jerry Davich and Krista Zivanovic later in the year. Thanks for watching. Join us next week for another Lakeshore Focus. Until then, I'm Keith Kirkpatrick saying, make a positive difference in our world today.